Welcome and thank you all for joining us here today at the launch landing facility at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. My name is Bill Gerstenmeyer and I'm the Vice President of Build and Flight Reliability. We're now about seven days away from safely launching Jared, Kid, Sarah, and Anna to space. Pretty amazing day today. Pretty amazing way to come to the Cape <laughs> we, as we got to see them. Human spaceflight has only been around since of the early 1960s and thanks to programs such as Mercury, Apollo, Gemini, the space shuttle program, new technology was designed, developed that helped make human spaceflight possible. You know, I've often said that human spaceflight is the ultimate team sport. No one individual or organization can know everything. One must share knowledge, what you know and what you don't know. And now the private sector has been added to the team who's been pushing the boundaries of what's possible for the last 10 to 15 years. The Polaris crew is helping to develop necessary technology needed to go to Mars. The suits they'll talk about, the laser-based communications, the spacecraft, and the environment will all help us get closer to going to the moon and Mars in the future. So the private sector is truly a portion of this great human spaceflight team. You know, what's special about this mission is that we have two SpaceX employees on the Polaris Dawn crew, Sarah and Anna. You each have individually contributed to the development of the SpaceX human spaceflight program, especially the Dragon capsule, and provided invaluable experience of training and supporting crews have really contributed in a big way to this mission. But what's really special is the knowledge that they're gonna gain from this mission, they can then bring back to SpaceX and share with the rest of the SpaceX team. What a great partnership between Sarah and Anna and the SpaceX team. We'll all benefit from this great endeavor. The crew's gonna share with you the details of the upcoming mission, what they've done to get ready for Monday's launch, and what they plan to do on orbit. But before that, I'll give you a little update of where we are right now. The Dragon will be transported to the Hangar 39A today, probably sometime this afternoon, uh, where the teams will start to make the spacecraft or mate the spacecraft to the Falcon 9 booster to launch Polaris Dawn. Safety is always our top priority, and we will have final checkouts and analysis to complete. The teams have a solid plan to complete all the work prior to the launch, and we will review everything to ensure we are really ready to launch. As such, I want to talk to you briefly about a recent development the SpaceX teams currently worked on and, and, and solved. When we're in the vacuum with 100% oxygen into the spacesuits, we want to eliminate as many flammability risks as possible. It turns out we discovered that in the dry environment there can be static electric discharge and that could potentially lead to a flammability concern. The teams went in to mitigate that. They've changed procedures, they've changed processes, they've added conductive material, and we are truly ready to go fly. This is an example of one of the many things that we learned on this flight that really haven't been exposed before in EVA suit development. So SpaceX and the teams and the crew, with their help, are continuing to push the envelope of what it takes to go to the moon and Mars. You know, we take the responsibility that we've been entrusted to us to fly the crew and return them safely home. Spaceflight is not easy. Our mission right now is to safely launch Polaris, support their multi-day mission, and return them home to their families and friends. Thank you to all of the SpaceX teams who worked so hard over the past two and a half years to prepare for this mission. This would be not possible without all the members of the SpaceX team. And thank you to Space Florida for helping us hold this hearing today, this briefing today. And thank you for the 45th for our help in the days to come. Jared and the crew, let's hear from you. Thank you. Thanks, Gers. Appreciate that. Um, so it's been, uh, it's been two and a half years since, uh, since we announced the uh, uh, Polaris, Polaris program and, and Polaris Dawn. It's been a really exciting journey of, uh, of development and training, and we're gonna, we're gonna take you through a little bit of that today. Uh, but first, just thought it would be good to refresh you all on, uh, on what the Polaris program is all about. So it's a joint program with SpaceX, as, as Gers talked about. The idea is to you know, develop, test uh, new technology and operations in furtherance of, um, 
of SpaceX's uh, bold vision uh, to enable humankind to journey among, among the stars. Now, uh, our first mission, which is, is kind of why we're all here today, um, we are about a week away from our, our first um, launch opportunity, which is, which is Polaris Dawn. And I'll kind of update you a little bit on, on some of the, uh, the big objectives of that shortly. The second mission will build off of what we learn from the first. And then the third mission will be the first crewed flight of Starship. I think a lot of you are already familiar with it. That's that incredible vehicle, fully reusable launch vehicle that's being built in Starbase, Texas. Um, have twice the thrust of the Saturn V. Uh, it could very well be the 737 for human space flight someday, but it'll, it'll certainly be the vehicle that will return humans to the moon uh, and then on to, to Mars and beyond. Now, uh, every one of these missions will be filled uh, with a number of objectives uh, that are meant to, again, uh, accelerate SpaceX's vision to make life multi-planetary. Uh, but you can always count on, uh, just as it is with this mission, that we will use every bit of the time available for science and research um, as well as uh, supporting St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, which we began our journey with uh, during Inspiration 4, raised over $250 million for them. We've raised millions since with Polaris Dawn and will continue to do so throughout the duration of the Polaris program. Um, so with that, let me, uh, let me reintroduce you to Polaris Dawn. So uh, I'm Jared Isaacman, and I am uh, really, really excited to meet, introduce you to uh, some of my closest friends uh, and crewmates. We spent uh, you know, the last two and a half years together really becoming a, a family as we got ready for, uh, for this mission. Now, we all have very interesting ties back uh, to Inspiration4, in the case of the kid, even, even prior to that. Um, we built a lot of trust during that, uh, during that mission. I think that allowed us to really hit the ground running and in, in combination with all the great people at SpaceX really accomplished a lot over the last two and a half years. Uh, so let's, let's start with, uh, you know, Kid Poteet. He is our uh, mission pilot. So he's a Air Force F-16 uh, background. He is a uh, aggressor commander, uh, a weapons officer, a famed Thunderbird combat pilot. And, uh, and he's been, uh, he's been he was supporting Inspiration4 as one of our mission directors, um, you know, prior to, to now. And then uh, we have uh, Anna Menon. Uh, she is our mission, uh, uh, special, mission specialist and uh, medical officer for Polaris Dawn. So she is a SpaceX engineer. Uh, she's a mission director at SpaceX. So she runs mission control when she's not going to space herself. Uh, prior to that, she was a biomedical engineer and supporting astronauts on console at NASA. And we have Sarah Gillis. She's also a mission specialist. She is a SpaceX engineer. Uh, she is a lead astronaut trainer. She's trained many of the crews, uh, the NASA crews that have gone to space, including my previous instructor on, uh, on Inspiration4. She also works in mission control as a core or like a Capcom familiar, and she's a very talented musician as well. Um, so it takes a huge team uh, to prepare for a mission like Polaris Dawn and support the broader Polaris program uh, objective. So, uh, we've got an awesome group, uh, many of them here, and many of them actually flew in with us today. So uh, Todd Leif Erickson is our, is our mission director. Sean Stroker Gustafson uh, is our deputy mission director. Um, we have uh, uh, Combo Weeks. She handles all of our science and research coordination. We have John Slickbaum. He's our uh, philanthropy director, all the coordination with St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and their important vision that no child should ever die in the dawn of life. Uh, I think many of you know, uh, you know John Snap Krause, our, uh, our content director, um, taking all those awesome pictures. We have Sarah Grover, our communications director, and then uh, Casey Phillips, and she's our, our project coordinator. I think more, even, even more importantly to emphasize, there are about 14,000 names that are, that are not on the screen in front of you. Uh, those are all the, uh, the SpaceXers that are, that are going to work every single day trying to make science fiction a reality. Um, it's really awesome and uh, you know, we're the four lucky ones that get to go on this ride, but I, I can't tell you how many teams have been working nonstop for the last two and a half years, you know, building, building a new EVA suit to do a spacewalk and the operations associated with it and the vehicle changes, the Starlink lasers, a bunch of things we're going we're gonna to talk to you about in order to make this possible all you know, supporting that kind of bigger dreams that you know, 
maybe not in the not too distant future, humans are gonna are gonna finally reach uh, another planet other than our own. Um, and it's awesome to see every day. I've, I've said it many times that um, the journey and being, uh, you know, the journey leading up to launch and, and being a fly on the wall to the to the history that SpaceX is making is just as good as flying the mission itself. Okay, uh, give you a little bit of the mission overview. Uh, so again, we're just uh, about a week away from our first launch opportunity. Uh, I think we're flying on uh, booster 1083, which will be its, its fourth flight. Uh, we'll be flying on uh, Dragon 207 uh, on its third flight. This is, uh, if you know the history of it, this is what Crew-1 uh, went to space on. This is what uh, I flew on previously for Inspiration4, and now Polaris Dawn will go on, which is pretty cool. Very low time Dragon. Uh, which is which is nice. We will launch from uh, 39A. Uh, we're expecting up to a five-day nominal uh, mission duration. We will launch into a 51.6 degree inclination and an orbital period of approximately 106 minutes, and that does vary based on the, the altitudes that we will be going to. Which brings us to the next point here. We will uh, insert uh, Falcon will drop us off in a 190 by 1200 kilometer uh, initial orbit. At that point, we will check out the Dragon, uh, make sure it's very, very healthy. Uh, we will pass through the South Atlantic anomaly, and then we will raise Apogee up to uh, our peak, which is 1,400 kilometers uh, that should uh, surpass the, the Gemini 11 record. Uh, and then after uh, approximately 10 hours, we will lower Apogee uh, to about a 190 by 700 kilometer orbit. And from there, we will, we will remain, we'll conduct our EVA, before eventually phasing down and uh, re-entering and splashing down either in the, the Gulf or, or the Atlantic. Now we do have uh, three launch T-zeros. We will eventually down-select uh, the day of the launch. The window uh, first opens at uh, approximately 0330 on the 26th and goes to approximately uh, 0700. Now, um, you know, when you, uh, when you go uh, higher into into space that comes with all sorts of potential challenges. You're putting a lot of energy into a vehicle, then you take it out. But there's other, other realities when you're up there too, which is a completely different micrometeorite orbital debris environment, uh, obviously a different radiation environment. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but Earth does a really good job as objects get closer to it to clean them up and burn them up. But that takes a really long time when it's higher up. So a lot of smart people at SpaceX figured out the optimal times for us to launch, which is why we have that launch window. Uh, and through um, uh, uh, vehicle pointing, so the attitude we're flying at, and then that low 190 perigee, we're able to uh, mitigate a lot of that orbital debris risk during those launch windows. So then just to take you through the uh, Polaris Dawn main uh, mission objectives, so our, uh, our first objective, uh, which uh, should take place during the first day uh, on orbit, um, is, a, uh, is an altitude record. Uh, so again, we'll go up to 1,400 kilometers. This is the farthest uh, humans have traveled. Uh, since the last time humans walked on the moon more than 50 years ago. And uh, two of my crew members, Sarah and Anna, will be the women who have traveled farthest from the Earth ever, uh, which I think is pretty, is pretty cool. Now, why, why do this, right? Um, as I mentioned before, um, when you go into this environment, you're dealing with totally different realities than, for example, when you would go to the, to the space station. So again, it's a lot of energy going into the vehicle. It's a lot of energy to take out of the vehicle when you come back home. It is a different radiation environment. It is a different micrometeorite orbital debris environment. And we stand to learn quite a bit from that uh, in terms of human health, science, and research. Uh, if we get to uh, Mars someday, we'd love to be able to come back and, and be healthy enough to tell people about it. So I think that's, it's worthwhile to get some exposure in that environment. Also, uh, it informs vehicle architecture because, generally speaking, vehicles don't like uh, radiation. So that's why we're going to stay there for the shortest amount of time uh, that's necessary to gather the data we want, and then we'll, we'll come back down. Our second major objective is uh, the first commercial spacewalk. Uh, in this case, we'll, and we'll take you through it a little bit, we are going to vent the vehicle entirely down to vacuum. There is no airlock on Dragon. Uh, that means all four crew members are exposed to the vacuum of space. Two will remain inside the vehicle, and two uh, in sequence will go outside the vehicle. When we are out there, uh, we're going to make use of uh, various mobility aids. Uh, the SpaceX team has engineered, and it'll look like we're doing a little bit of a dance. And what that is is we're going through a series of test matrix on the suit, and the idea is to learn as much as we possibly can about this suit and get it back to the engineers to inform future uh, suit uh, design evolutions. Um, and you know, we do that. We're super, we're super proud, knowing the massive amount of effort that went into to making these suits, and and just shortly. Um, 
uh, Sarah is going to take you through what that development process is like. Uh, but it's not lost on us that, you know, might be 10 iterations from now and a, a bunch of evolutions of the suit, but that uh, someday someone could be wearing a version of which that, uh, that might be walking on Mars. And uh, it feels, uh, feels like, again, a huge honor to have that opportunity to test it out on this flight. Um, so we will learn as much as we can uh, about that suit. The uh, entire operation is scheduled to be about two hours uh, from venting to repress. We're building a lot of, a lot of uh, margin there for, for thing, anything unexpected to go on, but uh, actual out of uh, vehicle time you know, could be uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, um, you know, 15 to, to 20 minutes each um, while we're out there. Um, next, uh, our third objective is we are testing out a new communication system. Uh, this is using uh, Starlink laser links. So there is a plaser that is mounted in the trunk of the uh, vehicle that we will be flying on. And through beams of light, it will communicate to other Starlink satellites. And, uh, and this, is, this is pretty cool. It is no uh, small task to have two objects going 17,500 miles an hour uh, communicating over a, a beam of light. But it has the opportunity to open up an entirely new communication pathway uh, not just for, for Dragon, but for armadas of starships or other satellites or telescopes out there and kind of free up some of the burden on the you know, existing TDRS and, uh, and ground station infrastructure. And then we will, as I mentioned before, use every bit of the time in between approximately uh, to accomplish approximately 40 in science, science and research experiments that, uh, that Anna will take you through in just a minute. Uh, now this slide, just for uh, give you an example, uh, of what uh, depicts the various orbits uh, that we'll be at relative to the International Space Station, Hubble, um, and where we flew previously on Inspiration4. And this very cool rendering gives you and I uh, a little bit of a depiction of what the uh, Starlink laser communication uh, should look like. And with that, I am very pleased to turn it over to Sarah to take us through development. Awesome. Um, so the mic working? There it is. Um, as Jared mentioned, this is obviously a development mission, and that's taken a ton of work across the SpaceX team in order to support these ambitious objectives. Um, so I'm going to take you through some of the modifications both to the spacecraft as well as the spacesuit. And what you'll see throughout these slides is that much of the development effort has really been focused on safely executing this spacewalk. Um, maybe first, I'm just going to paint a little bit more of a picture of the spacewalk and what to expect. Um, so actually, about an hour onto orbit, we'll start preparations for the EBA, um, where we begin a pre-breathe protocol. And this pre-breathe is really designed to help. On flight day two, we'll get pressurized in the suits and actually go through a mobility demo, where we step through the sequence and movements inside the spacecraft and really make sure there was nothing missed in our training, that we're confident before we step outside. And then flight day three is the spacewalk. Um, so that morning, we'll go through system checkouts on both the life support system and the suits before all of us get pressurized on 100% oxygen. We'll complete the final um, pre-breathe on 100% oxygen before we vent the spacecraft. Once at vacuum, EV-1 will open the hatch before um, EV-1 and EV-2 serially will go outside and uh, complete the test matrix that Jared mentioned of suit mobility objectives. Uh, once complete, uh, EV-2 will close the hatch and then we'll proceed with repressing the spacecraft and then continue with the science and research for the remainder of the mission. So stepping into some of the spacecraft side modifications that were needed to actually accomplish this. Um, one of the more substantial efforts was upgrades to the life support systems. This includes adding a lot more oxygen to the spacecraft so that we can feed oxygen to four suits through umbilicals for the full duration of the spacewalk. There have been upgrades and additions to the envir environmental sensing suite in the spacecraft to make sure we have really good insight both before, during, and after exposure to vacuum. And what you can see here is actually a new addition, an entirely new system, a nitrogen repress system. Um, this is kind of a closeout shroud over two redundant uh, nitrogen tanks that will be used to repressurize the spacecraft um, once we're complete with the EVA. With all of these life support system upgrades, obviously there's a ton of testing that needs to go into this. And that's both at a component level, but then also at a full scale system level. Um, so what you see here is the Dragon spacecraft actually going into a thermal vacuum chamber. Um, and we ran the end-to-end -end sequence, both depressing 
the capsule, dwelling, a vacuum, and then repressing the spacecraft using all the software, hardware, and integrated systems that we expect to use for this flight. Um, additionally, at vacuum, we performed a long duration dwell on the interior at vacuum so that we could actually bake out a lot of the materials on the inside, remove some um, chemicals that would off gas in the vacuum of space before we're actually in that environment. There's been a lot of addition of new mobility aids to support suited mobility in the spacecraft. So you're actually looking up through the top of the spacecraft here at what we call the Skywalker. And this is a new structure that's been added outside the forward hatch that we'll use during the spacewalk, um, both as a handhold and footholds uh, for some of the testing we'll perform. There's also new handholds around, both around and on the forward hatch of the spacecraft for interior operations, as well as some new camera views, both on the mobility aid and the nose cone to capture footage during the spacewalk. Um, the forward hatch has also been upgraded to include a motor to assist with hatch opening. Here you can see the Starlink Wi-Fi router inside the spacecraft. Um, and this connects to the laser system that Jared mentioned in the trunk called the plug-in laser. You might think getting internet might be as easy as just flipping that switch, turning on your internet, but it's not. Um, we're talking about a laser sending information to a Starlink satellite that is moving at orbital velocity down to Earth and then back again. Um, so it's been an incredible development effort by the SpaceX team. And on a personal note, I've taken um, specific interest in this development effort, and we have a special message that we will share with the world using this technology. Um, so next, getting into uh, what I actually noticed is on all of your badges, which I love, um, development of the EVA suit. So here it is, first generation SpaceX EVA suit. And I think it just looks so cool. I know we are all just feel so grateful to be able to test out this piece of technology. So what you see here is a design evolution of the new um, EVA suit. It is a design evolution from the IVA suit, the intravehicular activity suit. And it includes all sorts of technology, including a heads-up display, a helmet camera, an entirely ar new architecture for joint mobility. There's thermal insulation throughout the suit, including a copper and indium tin oxide visor that both provides thermal protection and solar protection. Um, and then throughout, there's all sorts of redundancy, both in the oxygen supply feed to the suit, as well as all of the valves, all of the seals across the suit. Um, it's an incredible suit. It's been a long journey to get here. And I'm uh, sure, as you guys know, we didn't start here. This isn't where we began. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of the development journey to get here. Um, so when we first started, we would come in every day for training. And pretty much every single day, We'd walk in and there would be a different suit. It would have a different glove, a different elbow, a different shoulder. And there was this constant iteration of suit components with the suit team to test and collect data. Um, in parallel with that, though, we also had to develop training for the suit. So the SpaceX team didn't have the ability to put this really constantly evolving hardware into a pool. So they came up with a really novel solution of a suspension system that has kind of simulated physics that allows you to pressurize the suit, put on a harness, and actually go through operations as if you are weightless. So it's a really cool analog environment. Um, they created our ability to do this both kind of in a vertical orientation simulator with all of our flight software, all of our vehicle interior, and then also in a sideways configuration that you can see here to support manual hatch operations, all of the tasks we need to perform to get in and out of the spacecraft. Um, so it was this uh, kind of constant iteration with the SpaceX team, both on the training side and the suit side. Well, we went through this progression. Um, you, we went and learned a lot, frankly. Um, you might think that we would be extremely cold out in the vacuum of, of space, and actually uh, we're more concerned about being too warm. So part of the learning we went through um, was trying to understand, quantify the thermal environments, what our metabolic rates will be. So what you see here is us pressurized in a suit. On top of that, you have an 8,000 meter down suit that you wear on Mount Everest. And then on top of that is another 8,000 meter down suit. Um, so we're really trying to create an environment that doesn't have convection, looking at the thermals, looking at what we'll actually experience in these suits. Uh, 
Um, another aspect of de development on this journey, um, as Jared mentioned, since Dragon doesn't have an airlock, the entire spacecraft is going to be going to vacuum. And I mentioned this kind of novel pre-breathe protocol, where we're starting at about 14.5 psi A and going down to about 8.65 as the last stage of our pre-breathe over a long period of time to slowly pull nitrogen out of our body and reduce our risk of decompression sickness. Um, to validate this test, we actually spent two whole days in a vacuum chamber at NASA Johnson Space Center, and we went through the entire protocol, um, stepping down pressure and then ultimately performing a simulated EVA on breathing masks of 100% oxygen, um, stepping through the full operation. Um, so here you can see us in the chamber during the simulated EVA transitioning onto oxygen masks. So this was kind of just a very cool ex uh, experimental validation of this protocol. The final crew test was actually wearing these incredible suits into the vacuum chamber. So we returned to Johnson Space Center and uh, we were in the front chamber or the front airlock of the chamber B. And we went through basically a full depress sequence, dwell at vacuum and repress. Um, looking at some of the manual hatch operations in the chamber, but really getting to see firsthand what it'll feel like in the suits as we go to vacuum. Um, so at this point, the suit has gone through an incredibly extensive testing campaign. Um, some of them have been mentioned, but we've covered everything from life cycle testing, pressure testing, MMOD testing, extreme hot and colds testing, an entire campaign on ESD and flammability testing. Um, it's, it's been a really impressive amount of work by the SpaceX team to test this suit for flight. Um, as a crew, we've spent probably more than 100 hours in this suit at this point. Um, and here is actually a picture of the final checkout of our flight suits in the flight spacecraft at our test drive. We're really looking forward to testing this first generation of suit. And this is a great visual to kind of show you what to expect for the spacewalk. So with that, I'll hand it over to Kid for training. Hello, hello, I'm Kid Poteet, uh, the mission pilot for Polaris Dawn. And as Gerst and uh, Uruk mentioned, uh, we've been at this journey for uh, two and a half years preparing for this historic mission. Uh, on a personal level, uh, flying fighter jets in the Air Force for 20 years, uh, combat experience, uh, operational test experience, uh, leading many red flag exercises, uh, fighter weapons school, uh, I can tell you without a doubt, this has been some of the most challenging training that I've ever experienced. And I, I could not imagine a more qualified crew than these three individuals uh, leading the charge, getting prepared for this mission. Um, we've been put through the ringer by Melissa, who is our lead trainer sitting in uh, row three. Uh, and it's been an awesome journey preparing for this mission. Um, and it also took, as, as Gerst and Jared mentioned, uh, an entire organization, 14,000 employees, and some of the brightest and smartest engineers I, I've ever met um, have been a part of this. And, and we're just so thankful for what uh, the resources and the, and the time and effort they put into this mission. Uh, as far as the training, uh, there's more or less three uh, objectives. First off, uh, to get us qualified in the operation of this spacecraft. Uh, secondly, um, it's about adaptation to the environment that we're going to live in for five days in space. It's very austere and we've got to get ready for that and there's ways that we do that. Uh, and then third, experiential learning. Uh, uh, setting up those uh, experiences that kind of put us in a, in a scenario that is, uh, uh, allows us the opportunity to get comfortable in an uncomfortable uh, environment and I'll talk about that. Um, to accomplish these objectives, we more or less have three categories. Procedural training, uh, physiology training, and practical training. As far as the uh, procedural training, uh, we spent a majority of our time, roughly about 2,000 hours in the simulator. Uh, we went through extensive academics, uh, uh, all the systems, uh, knowledge of the spacecraft, um, crew resource management, communications amongst the crew, as well as with uh, mission control. Uh, nominal procedures, contingency operations, emergency procedures, all these things uh, culminated with the, the 2,000 hours that we spent in the simulator. Now to put this in perspective, I, I flew fighters for 20 years. 
I, I accomplished about 1,500 hours in the simulator training for combat, um, and, and that's over 20 years. This is uh, two and a half years in the making and over 2,000 hours. So it, it's been very extensive, uh, and it's uh, a reliance upon these three individuals to get me through this program. Uh, this is a picture of us in the, in the buck, uh, our home away from home. A replication of the capsule, and, and we spent a lot of time going through the nominal and the contingency operations uh, for our mission. Uh, we do that uh, in our normal clothes, and we do it in, in, the, in the spacesuit to replicate uh, what we'll experience on orbit. And this is obviously uh, Rook interacting with the, with the systems. Uh, more pictures of us in the capsule. And then as far as the uh, physiology training, adapting to the environment that we're going to live in, uh, we accomplished this training through the centrifuge, through the altitude chamber, <laughs> the vacuum chamber, zero-g flights, and it's all to provide, you know, it's, it's very challenging to replicate space on Earth. Uh, but there's certain tools and resources that we can utilize to kind of get a feel for it and adapt and build our confidence uh, for those stressors. The centrifuge, uh, similar to what we do in the Air Force, just a slightly different orientation uh, based on the sensation of the G-forces that we'll experience on the way up and the way down. Um, and, and we'll accomplish that in the, in the centrifuge. And it's about four and a half, five Gs on the way up, uh, various transitions as we go through MECO and SECO, uh, ultimately arriving on space uh, and that zero G ex experience. Uh, the altitude chamber. Um, we spent time in there getting familiar with our symptoms of hypoxia, uh, there are various uh, PSIAs, uh, uh, pressures that we'll experience throughout the, um, the pre-brief protocol, the five-phase pre-brief protocol, um, anywhere from atmospheric 14.7, working our way all the way down to when we're at vacuum, we'll be at uh, five PSI in, inside our suit. Uh, all the while, we have different um, uh, oxygen concentration levels, uh, anywhere from 20% all the way up to uh, 100% uh, on the pre-brief. We did the zero G flights, which are a lot of fun. But again, it's, it's hard to replicate. These are 30 second intervals. So we utilize this opportunity to, to accomplish some of our science and research to see what that would feel like. And we gotta stay healthy. And these two are gonna keep us healthy because uh, they're the smartest of the, of, the, of the group. So they went through a very extensive uh, medical training um, at uh, participating in partnered hospitals uh, to get fully qualified to take care of us on orbit. And so the fun part, so we did a lot of practical uh, training, getting comfortable in uncomfortable uh, scenarios. Uh, scuba diving, it's very difficult to communicate uh, when you're underwater. Um, temperature you gotta deal with, uh, uh, but it also provides that uh, buoyancy that uh, can help us train for uh, microgravity when we're on orbit. Fighter jets, that's probably the easiest thing I, I was able to do uh, throughout this two and a half years. Um, why is that important? Well, again, it's, it's uh, a, a little more stressful environment. Uh, communication can be challenging when you're communicating over radio. Uh, close proximity, we're gonna build the trust uh, and the confidence that we have in each other. Uh, and then we climbed Cotopaxi, uh, just shy of 20,000 feet down in Ecuador. Uh, so why is that important? Well, when it's a uh, multi-day journey to get to the summit, you're dehydrated, you're hungry, you're grouchy because sleep it sucks. Uh, and, and you learn a lot about yourself under this uh, stressful environment and you learn a lot about each other. Uh, so that was a really good training experience for the team. And we did the skydiving. Uh, we went to the U.S. Air Force Academy and went through their very rigorous uh, program, the only program in the world where your first jump is solo free fall. Uh, so again, that, that kind of took us through this uh, very uh, demanding um, uh, training syllabus in order to uh, skydive and jump out of an aircraft. And this was just uh, some uh, supplemental training, jumping off the uh, uh, high meter platform at the Air Force Academy, because we could. So with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Anna for uh, Science and Research. Thanks, Kate. So as Jared mentioned, Science and Research is our fourth major mission objective. We have partnered with approximately 30 institutions around the world to execute a series of approximately 40 science and research experiments as a part of this mission. They generally fall into three categories. The first category is human health. We are born into 1G when you go into 0G, whether it's for five days or a nine month trip to Mars, things change. 
you have bone density loss, you have vision changes, you have severe motion sickness, and we don't have answers for all of that. The second category is research that can take advantage of the unique mission profile that we are flying. For example, we are doing a spacewalk, and when you do that, you reduce the pressure. With that, just like when you open a can of soda, bubbles are released. So we are using ultrasound to monitor for those bubbles. The third category involves, you know, there's problems that we face here on Earth, and including when astronauts come back from space, they face challenges upon returning to Earth's gravity. For example, astronauts often experience disorientation and balance issues upon returning to gravity, and we are testing out ways to help with that. So what you see here is that pressure chamber that we're living in for two days that Sarah mentioned. But what's really neat about this is that we had the opportunity to practice a lot of the experiments we will do in space, but while we were also experimentally validating our pre-brief protocol for our EVA. You might just think that this looks like a flight simulator, but really what it relates to is cognitive abilities. By the time you get to your destination on a mission, be it Moon or Mars, you want to have retained the, the skills that you trained when you left back on Earth. So we are testing out training techniques to help with this. This is a device that uses blood flow restriction to help improve the efficacy of exercise in space and also helps improve the effects of fluid shifts that astronauts experience when they go to space. We have a number of experiments looking into those eye changes that I mentioned occur for astronauts. One, you can see here, uses this contact lens that we will wear, and it measures intraocular pressure for extended periods of time, and so we can hope to better understand the mechanisms behind these eye changes. Now, as we look into a future where there are hundreds or thousands of people living in space for long durations of time, it is only a matter of time before there is a medical emergency that requires intervention. So we can help prepare for this through experiments like the one you see here. This uses an endoscope or a camera that we will insert through our nose into our airway to gather imagery and look for challenges like inflammation. Now I mentioned before those balance issues that astronauts face when they return to a gravity environment. Here you can see us testing a tool that might help with this. It uses electricity shot between the inner ears to simulate that disorientation and teach more rapid adaptation skills. And then finally, looking into the future, artificial gravity is one thing that could help make all of these issues go away. But it comes at a cost, and that is severe motion sickness. But scientists think that when you go to space, you might be less impacted by that disorientation that comes from spinning required for artificial gravity. So we will test that hypothesis. Now, this mission is testing technologies that contributes to our collective future in human space exploration. But we also believe it is important to address the challenges that we face here on Earth today. And one of the ways we are doing that is by raising funds and awareness for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. This is a continuation of what was started on Inspiration4. They raised over $250 million for St. Jude, and we are continuing that. The difference here is that we are taking our message all around the world, because Starlink goes all around the world. We took Starlink to the Philippines. We distributed Starlink terminals to hospitals around the world to help support remote medicine capabilities. We are helping to build a new facility to help patients who are undergoing treatment. And then on a personal note, I authored a book named Kisses from Space, and the proceeds from that will go to benefit St. Jude. So here we are, sitting seven days out from our first launch opportunity. What do the days ahead look like? So our major goal is to stay healthy. But we are lucky in that we have a lot to keep us busy and our minds focused and sharp in those days. That includes science and research prep, data collection, some flying, and some of our official duties, including launch readiness review and a dry dress rehearsal of launch day in our capsule. But you probably most care about what we will actually do on orbit. So we get to launch. launch we get into space in about 10 minutes. About an hour after getting there, we will start our, that pre-brief protocol that Sarah mentioned. 
We will soon thereafter raise to our peak apogee. And while we're there, we will be passing through the inner, re inner regions of Earth's Van Allen radiation belt. And that brings us to flight day two. Flight day two, I will read the book I authored to my family as well as some of the brave patients of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And then we will lower to our cruise orbit. At that point, we will begin our spacewalk preparations. We will perform that mobility test. We will check out our spacesuits and we will configure the cabin. Flight day three is EVA day. We will wake up, have several hours of preparations, including final cargo configurations, ECLIS checkouts, and preparing biomedical monitoring devices for the spacewalk. We'll don our spacesuits, do a suit leak check, and then perform the EVA. This entire thing will be live streamed, so please join. Flight day four is the Starlink demonstration day. So we will have some checkouts and then perform a series of demonstrations as a part of that test. You'll wanna stay tuned for this. And then flight day five is our final full day on orbit. This, we will be wrapping up all of that research that we, I mentioned earlier. We do have research weaved in every single day of the mission, but this will be our last day to gather as much data as possible for the scientists back here on Earth. Then we will begin our re-entry preparations and that brings us to flight day six. We will don our spacesuits, re-enter through Earth's atmosphere and then splash down off the coast of Florida at one of SpaceX's seven sites. When we get back, we will be recovered by the SpaceX recovery vessel and then we will owe some time to science and research and reconnecting with our families. And then we will be looking forward to talking with all of you again. So with that, we will take any questions you have. Right, so if you could uh, please come up to the microphone, uh, state your affiliation and who you'd like to address your question to. We'll take uh, one or two questions from each, each reporter. Um, hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Marcia Dunn, AP. Um, NASA has long considered spacewalks the riskiest part of any space flight after launch and entry. And Bill, so as a former NASA guy, what do you see as the riskiest part of this spacewalk, the world's first private spacewalk with brand new suits. Um, Jared, if you could also add on to that. And do you see a time when someone with minimal training could just go up and do it for fun? Um, what's the future of that besides planning for Mars and all that? Thank you. I think as you heard from the crew, how much work went into the suit and the preparation and to make sure that this was gonna be as safe as it possibly could you're right, EVA is a risky adventure, but again, we've done all the preparation. We did the capsule testing, we did the suit testing, we did the hyperbaric chambers, we did all the work to really get ready for this. You know, we kind of built off of what NASA's heritage was, but I think we've also extended NASA's heritage a little bit further. Some of the joints in the suits are much better than, than we've had in the NASA world. Some of the other capabilities, the heads-up display is also a new a new thing that's coming into the spacesuit world. So I think it's a really a tribute to this team that they advanced the state of the art and we're gonna do it as safely as we can. And we've got the right protocols and we've done the right testing to get ready to go do it. Go ahead, Jared. Yeah, I guess just to layer onto it. Um, I mean, the, the EVA is, is a, probably makes up the majority of the development uh, for Polaris Dawn. Um, I mean, an absolute extensive amount of time has gone into it. Uh, so much so that I, I was actually far more concerned, and, and it and is rightfully, why, why would it be the riskiest part? Because you're throwing away all the safety of your vehicle, right? And it now comes down to your suit becomes your spaceship. Um, I'd say, personally, I was almost concerned to some extent that, that we are way too focused on the EVA. What about all the other things? And that's where, you know, in the, in the handful of months uh, approaching, uh, you know, your certification for flight, SpaceX begins all of their paranoia reviews, as, as you would call it, where they look at everything. I mean, start essentially all over again. Um, we, we participate in every single risk briefing, um, you know, some of which was covered in Gert's initial remarks, like you know, flammability related concerns. We were, we were brought out to White Sands Missile Range to see whether they do the MMOD testing. So, I mean, the, the, the communication, the transparency with SpaceX from the beginning all the way through the end, especially when I said like they literally start all over again to look at every piece of the mission, not just the EBA, is what inspires so much confidence. And in terms of like, can, can anyone, you know, do this someday? I would actually say like it, it, the, the training in the suit 
was was super fun and exciting. I think actually where where it, it might not be for everyone is the uh, is the development side of it when we're trying different suits out and they're saying let's let's try today to see how hot we can make it and put on two eight thousand meter suits. <laughs> That's probably you know uh, I know we all found it enjoyable. I don't know if every everybody would or like you know let's see how cold we can make it with liquid nitrogen. Um, so the development side, which is I, I think very appealing to us, is, is maybe not necessarily for everybody. But once your suit is good and you're ready to go. Um, I imagine, you know, a lot of people someday in the future are going to be, you know, maybe even families bouncing around on the lunar surface in their, in their, EVA, in their SpaceX EVA suit. Certainly possible. And, and one quick follow-up is SpaceX, did they cover the whole cost of the spacesuit development? I mean, is that all in-house, all the tech that went into that, all the research? I, I think it's shared across the, the Polaris team along with SpaceX. But again, you know, our company's vision is to make us multi-planetary in the future. So this is an investment in the future. So the company is willing to make those R&D investments to, per, to get us ready to move human presence beyond low Earth orbit. Jeff Bounce of Space News. A question for Mr. Mr. Isaacman. When you announced the Polaris program two and a half years ago, you were looking at flying this mission perhaps by late 2022. Um, you talk about what things caused the schedule to slip. Um, was it just the spacesuit development or other factors? And what gives you confidence that you are ready to go now at this point? Yeah. Well, I think actually the fact that it has taken two and a half years is where you get confidence. Um, if it perhaps if it was the initial nine month time frame, I think we'd probably all be wondering how how we were able to work that quickly. Um, I would say that this is a, one of the many kind of um, you know philosophies that I've observed at SpaceX that gets people very motivated. Is you set some very very ambitious deadlines up front uh, to get people working really hard in the right direction, but there's lots of good sanity checks along the way to say, are we, are we, is this now right or, or should we move it out? So I think it was right in the, in the beginning to say we're going we're gonna to try and achieve this at like, you know, light speed. Um, and uh, and it, it, you can't just point entirely to the suit being a part of it. I mean, the briefings we received from the engineers on the Starlink side were, I mean, incredible. Uh, you know, the, the amount of work that goes into it. and I. I think um, you know during the launch webcast they're going to show some behind the scenes from the engineers because I'd never want anyone to just think it is just throwing the on switch on, on say the internet. That was uh, a massive engineering challenge to solve, as was the suit and the operations to even support the suit. Having a good suit's fine, but you still have to vent the vehicle and repress it uh, so that you don't need to remain in the suit through the duration of the mission. So I, I think there's just a lot of things. There are ambitious objectives. These are all, and those ambitious objectives came with real engineering challenges, and it, and it took a big organization effort to get there. But as I mentioned before, we were briefed extensively in the months leading up to this through all the par paranoia reviews, the um, flight readiness review that happens a decent while ago, and you're hearing from every engineer, you know, green, yellow, red, how we're looking and being kept informed right up to the end. So that's where you get all the confidence that we're ready. And just to quickly follow up, um, can you give sort of a ballpark estimate of, of how much money you've invested into this program so far? Not a chance. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Richard Shabu, Orlando Sentinel. I really am curious about uh, the danger of opening up this spacecraft in space. Not only just the idea of going in vacuum and what are the contingency, I mean, Scott talked about this, the uh, contingency and emergency things. I mean, how many simulations do you go through? Is there a, a, a timeline for if there's a major emergency getting back to Earth safely? And uh, is the 700 kilometer uh, orbit uh, more dangerous with micrometeorites and whatnot? So just uh, if, if any of you could speak to that. Thank you. Anybody like it? Sure. Huh? Contingency. Oh, sorry. Um, so Throughout the EVA program um, and the development of this, that, that's really where they started with is what are the contingencies we need to plan for and how do we ensure crew can get home safely? Um, so there's some um, really interesting operations that have been developed both to ensure we have a good landing site that's within reachable target at the start of the spacewalk, for instance. Um, but we have spent so much time drilling contingency responses, drilling all different flavors of responses we might need to have on the spacewalk. Um, it's, as a trainer, I actually think we have used up all the ideas I had at the start of this for what I might want to throw. Melissa's done an excellent job kind of sprinkling in everything she could throw at us at this point. Um, but there's been a lot of work just to ensure we have the right response for any scenario we can think of. Uh, what about the 700 kilometer altitude? 
I think that our, our orbit was designed uh, to be uh, highly elliptical, where at least you know, approximately half of the orbit is going to benefit from being a, a very low perigee um, you know, of 190 kilometers. Um, 700 kilometers at apogee certainly has more MMOD than 190 or 400. But again, the, the T0 times that were picked um, you know, for this mission is what uh, gives us you know, the, um, the, the best, uh, the best uh, window to minimize the impact of, of MMOD. Uh, so we feel pretty good about it. And maybe just to add on that, for the spacewalk itself, we'll be orienting the vehicle in a way that shields the crew members. So it's kind of a really clever way of both providing shade through the nose cone and then also additional protection of spacecraft. Uh, just one quick thing. How long is the tether? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, long enough to, to get the job done, not long enough to do you know, the original uh, you know, depiction of us floating in space. So. <laughs> Hello, uh, Anthony Leone, Spectrum News. Uh, with all the training that you guys have done, was there any part where it made you the most uncomfortable and uh, maybe dread a little bit or maybe make changes to when you're ready to do it for real next week? I'm not sure everyone initially loves skydiving, but we got there. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us aren't used to throwing away a good airplane. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think that anything stands out as causing us to change our plans. I think they actually just contributed to our learning, our preparedness, um, taught us a, gave us a toolbox of skills that we will use throughout our mission. And I think what's really cool about the development effort is we started with an idea of the operation and then we started testing it and iterating on it and it was like okay we very clearly need a mobility aid to go here otherwise we're not going to be able to do what we need here so it, it's i'd say as we went through training we were just working hand in hand with the spacex team to modify the vehicle and add what we needed when we ran into issues so it's been a really cool evolution over time and i think i mean spending thousands of hours in the simulator is what helped build our confidence for dealing with any scenario that Melissa decided to throw at us. I mean, it was very challenging, like, like I highlighted in my, in my portion, but um, experiencing those and trying to identify what is wrong and then how do we work together to solve those issues is, is certainly built our confidence to be able to handle that. Uh, very low probability, but be able to handle that on orbit. Thank you. Hey everybody, I'm James. I'm from Channel 6. I'm a local reporter here in Cape Canaveral. Hey I was wondering for Anna and Sarah, from your early days of working on developing Dragon, did you always want to fly on it too? And is your confidence in your spacecraft why you're willing to take the risk of going to space? Thank you. I think for me, I dreamed of going to space from a very young age. I grew up in Houston, another space city, and I was exposed to space on a field trip and got to experience a day in the life of an astronaut and a flight controller in mission control, and I fell in love with the industry. Um, and so I have dreamed of going to space from a very young age, but I've also just been so happy and grateful to contribute to it in any way. Um, I think Working at SpaceX gives me a tremendous amount of confidence going to space. I see the way they do development. I see the way they handle risks, handle change, handle every piece of the mission, and that just gives me tremendous confidence going forward. I was recently sitting in the simulator and just remembering the entire development effort that went into it. And you've spent, I think Anna and I can both agree that you spend a huge amount of your job pretending to be an astronaut and thinking through what they would care about, you know, how the design should come together on the interior. Um, so I think I cannot wait to actually test this in space and bring back knowledge to the engineers from all these little design decisions that we made along the way of what worked well, what doesn't work well, what we should consider for future space flight. Um, but I completely agree with Anna with respect to confidence in flying in the vehicle. The whole process and the, the infrastructure at SpaceX for how we do human spaceflight is immensely confidence inspiring. Um, for me, my husband is actually also a SpaceX engineer and he helped build the propulsion system on our spacecraft. 
So um, I know exactly what goes into the testing and the design and the rigor behind absolutely everything in the spacecraft. So very, very excited to fly on my favorite Dragon spacecraft. Hi, Irene Klotz with uh, Aviation Week and Space Technology. Um, so speaking of your Dragon spacecraft, I think this question is probably for Gerst. Um, do you expect to be able to reuse this Dragon after it's been depressurized in orbit? And for you and for Jared, uh, what do you consider the riskiest parts of this mission? Thanks. Yeah, we, we definitely will be able to use this spacecraft again after it's been exposed to vacuum. You know, we initially didn't have the, uh, the chamber test that you got to see in the video. But again, part of our due diligence was, well, what really happens? We took an earlier Dragon to vacuum, and we wanted to see what happened. But we said, well, why don't we take the current version of Dragon to vacuum and see what happens? And that test <laughs> turned out that it was pretty benign to the spacecraft. It's fine. <coughs> it'll be able to be reused again. And then I'll let Jared kind of answer the second part. Well, I, th I, I mean, I think, you know, Gerst already covered it previously. Certainly, if you're going to vent the vehicle down to vacuum and open the hatch, that you are taking on a lot of risk at that point. I think it just goes into the preparations for that risk that I, I believe have been well mitigated. You know, we, we have manual ways to open the hatch. We have a uh, hatch motor to open or close uh, the hatch. We have redundant seals. Those seals have been, um, you know, uh, um, They've been placed in the hatch with uh, like a, a greater amount of sealant than they, they normally were on, say, like Inspiration4. Um, you know, you have redundancy with uh, two different nitrogen systems. Either one of us, either one, should one fail, can get us back up to a, uh, a habitable environment. You have two different pathways for oxygen. I mean, look, you know, it's like at some point or time or another, if we are to unlock this, this last great frontier and people are going to venture out in space, which by the way, whatever risks associated with it, there is, it is worth it. We have no idea what it could do to really, you know, um, you know again, change the trajectory of, of, of humankind. Um, so like at some point, somebody, you know, kind of, there has to be some first steps in this direction, but they are really well thought out, well mitigated, um, you know, for the benefit of, of, of those that will follow, that will inevitably be doing spacewalks to, you know, build, construct, repair, uh, discover. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it, I, I think, you know, objectively would be the riskiest part of the mission. It's also the one that's received rightfully probably the majority of the last two and a half years of attention. Hi, uh, thank you. I'm Ken Kramer from Space Up Close. Uh, Jared, I want to ask you, um, first I want to thank you for what you did for St. Jude. I'm a pharmaceutical research scientist for many decades making medicines. So I know how important that is, and I know what you contributed, and keep doing it, because you know the public needs it. There's not a lot of understanding in the public for science, so thanks for doing that. So my question is looking a little bit in the future for science. You worked on maybe doing a Hubble repair mission that Bill was involved with, the launches and the, and the uh, repairs. Um, are you thinking about that anymore, any new ideas you might about that you might be able to share with us also want to ask you about the viper nasa has just canceled the viper mission very sadly and they're giving it up is that something you might be interested in taking on it just needs a little bit of testing and uh any other robotic missions to the moon or mars these are critical missions to help us get to the moon and mars so what are your thoughts thank you um, um Appreciate the questions and the, the comments on, on St. Jude. And it, that, that's a huge team effort, by the way. I mean, I think over a million people donated uh, during uh, Inspiration4, which uh, it was that process that ultimately brought us uh, Chris Zimbrowski, who, who joined the Inspiration4 crew. So it's a team effort inside of Polaris, and uh, it's a team effort for everyone who's contributing to, uh, to that important cause. Um, and it's a team effort that goes into everything as it, as it, as it relates to, uh, to this mission. So we're going we're gonna to learn an awful lot um, you know, from, uh, from Polaris Dawn. Uh, it's big, very ambitious objectives. We'll come back with a lot of data. And that's what will ultimately inform uh, you know, the, the second mission. I, I, I think that this journey of creating you know, uh, affordable uh, EVA suits that can be scaled up into mass production is a very worthwhile one. Uh, you know, you, there's going to be an armada of starships arriving on Mars at some point in the future, and there's people are going to have to be able to get out of it and, and walk around and, and do important things. Um, and that shouldn't, those suits themselves shouldn't cost uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, and the risk associated with things like DCS should be as close to zero. And that's, that's a very ongoing effort by uh, a lot of people. Um, yeah, I, I can't say that I am um, 
I'm familiar. Uh, I've seen some of the news about the Viper cancellation and such. The last, honestly, um, handful of months have been pretty concentrated on what, what we're trying to do here today. But I will say, like, it, it's a good question because, um, you know, there is a lot that we stand to gain out there. And I think that the private sector, um, you know, investing capital, uh, kind of accelerating this whole world of commercial space is a really is a really good thing if we want to have a hope of kind of figuring out some of those those you know those questions that we've been thinking about for for a very long time in our lifetime. So governments aren't always the greatest capital allocators. We can absolutely cheer them on in their great efforts, but it's great to cheer on the private sector too and investments that they can make in order to you know unlock this last frontier. So, so anything about Hubble or maybe other robotic science missions you might be interested in. Oh, we'll come back from this one and, uh, and see where we go from here, but we, we definitely have a Polaris 2 that'll, that'll be up next. Okay, I hope you think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bill Harwood, uh, CBS News. I think for Sarah, can you give us a little bit more insight into the suit? A lot of us are, you know, remember the NASA shuttle suits, you know, the water-cooled undergarments and the 30-minute oxygen supply on the leg and all of those things. What are the thermal constraints that your suit can handle? Can you go out in sunlight? Uh, can you go out in, in dead of night? Um, and how do, you, how do you mitigate that the thermal extremes you see in space? And how does that figure into when you decide to go stick your head out? Great oh, question. One more. Let me stick in one more before I'll, I'll walk away. Uh, Jared, you mentioned uh, the longer tether and all that. We're all, you mentioned Ed White's first space swap with the greatest EVA picture ever taken, I think. Sure is. Uh, just for the record, why not go all the way out there? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, so, you know, we are, um, we really started looking at the lessons across the NASA's incredible portfolio of EVA development over time and have built the EVA around the objectives we really want to get out of this suit. Um, maybe giving you a little more description of the suit itself. So the suit is fed from oxygen supply in the spacecraft using the umbilical to the suit and there are two redundant paths within that. There's a primary path and a secondary path for oxygen. Um, but really the, the suit has been tested for any environment it can see. From sun exposure to um, extreme dark, there aren't restrictions on when we can actually go outside the spacecraft. Um, we will kind of serially be progressing EV1, go outside, come back in, then EV2, go outside, come back in. Um, so I would say at this point, the amount of testing is bounding of pretty much any condition we could see in space, as well as much beyond that. Um, so they've tested really, really extreme temperatures, both on the hot end and the cold end in this, in this development effort. Hi, Josh Jenner with space.com. Uh, I'd love to hear from the whole crew. This will be SpaceX's first crewed launch uh, since its return to flight after its uh, mishap last month. What was it like to witness that happen, knowing you had a flight coming up? Uh, what went through your head? And as SpaceX engineers, what was it like to know about the problem, see that problem, and, and kind of see how it went about getting solved? I would say SpaceX did an incredible job of keeping us informed every step of the way. You know, within seconds of it happening, we were talking to SpaceX, um, and then we're kept in the loop every single day as SpaceX addressed the problem dug into it, tried to understand what was going on, and very qu quickly thereafter resolved it. So, um, you know, I would say that that was really confidence inspiring. I think, you know, as a SpaceXer, it didn't even surprise me at all. I, this is the way SpaceX does business, and they make sure to look at all of the data, get to the root cause, and then develop all of the fixes necessary to, to get to the other side. Um, and so I think it's it has just been a really confidence-inspiring journey, actually. Yeah, and over the process, first it was, let's address this problem and solve, figure out what's going on. But then, after that, it was, let's do a scrub across everything, across the entire Falcon vehicle, across the entire Dragon spacecraft, and think ahead on what could be future failures that we want to think about. Like, what are the other things we might be susceptible that we haven't thought about recently? Um, so completely agree with Anna, it's been incredibly confidence-inspiring um, as they've gone through this effort and kept us informed every step of the way. Communication, competence, completeness, and crew is what I can come up with. First <laughs> off, communication, Gerst. Uh, the briefs that he provided us were, were extremely thorough, um, and competence is his team that, that solved it. Um, 
uh, and he was providing us the information all along the way. Completeness, they, they made sure every single element, it just wasn't the issue, it was, it was everything else they went and, and dug around in the, uh, the, the rocket and the, and the capsule itself. And then uh, lastly, it's the crew. It's relying on these guys' expertise to interpret and provide uh, me some elementary explanation of what's going on. I guess just to layer on, uh, we received phone calls within, I don't know, 30 minutes of the anomaly. Um, now mo I think most of us were watching it anyway. Uh, so there, there were already some, some text messages going um, when we saw some of the, the ice forming on it. I think what was in, you know, instantaneous like was, uh, you know, how would, uh, how would the launch escape system that's built into uh, you know, the vehicle have responded? And, and the reality is we, we, we would have been dropped off in orbit just fine. The launch, they have you know, 100 others and reconstructing down to the diagram level to the millisecond of exactly what happened. Um, and then the visuals associated with it and then retracing all the steps that led to that point. And you're in the loop of that entirely. So that it's like there's no mysteries as to the cause and then what the fix is and what's the associated rationale with it. Um, and obviously that's gotta be good enough for us. It's gotta be good enough for the FAA. It's gotta be good enough for every one of the SpaceXers that knows that you know, they don't want setbacks on the road to Mars, right? Um, so I, I'd say like it was all uh, very confidence inspiring. It didn't matter from, uh, from our perspective whether we were the first launch you know, after the anomaly when they were cleared to return to flight or the fifth or 10th, like we were, you know, it would have been equally as confident. Discussion uh, about delaying the mission, and if I could ask also, Mr. Isaacman, uh, this will be your second time going to space. Did you bring anything from that experience into the training uh, for this mission that didn't that you didn't go through the first time? Um, well, I think there. I mean, obviously, the SpaceX did stand down for some period of time, so there there was a delay. Um, you know, but I, I think you know, considering the, this, you know, the situation, we, they got back at it with their missions very quickly, and and we're back at it now with a human spaceflight mission. Um, uh, and again, I think that's really just the amount of data they gather, and you know, the footage they get of it just left no mysteries as to the cause. And if you if you know the cause, then you can put a fix in place. And a lot of smart people were working on it. I also want to just uh, emphasize um, the point that Sarah raised too. You know, being on some of those calls, and you I think most people here know Kiko, who is vice president of um, you know launch and recovery operations. He, he volunteering up the organization. I've got a few thousand people that are happy to go and check everything else that we think could potentially go wrong in the future while we have this time. So not just staying laser focused on the one particular issue, but what else could potentially haunt us. Let's get ahead of it. So that again, all really. Um, you know, confidence inspiring. In terms of like, uh, I, I had a lot of takeaways that are similar to like when you go mountain climbing or whatnot, it's like should pack less um, on everything. And, uh, and just, I, I think the idea that, you know, space adaptation syndrome impacts, you know, 50 to 60% of astronauts throughout 600 plus people have been to orbit. Doesn't matter if you're hardcore fighter pilot or not, you're just as, you know, just as susceptible to it. So um, we didn't have a physician assistant traveling on this one. So you had two really, really awesome individuals that logged, I think, a few weeks of emergency room t uh, time, uh, in addition to academic training and such, to be prepared uh, you know, from the medical side. Because we want everybody really happy and healthy, and we go into day three when we're, uh, we're conducting the EVA. Thank you. Hi, Max Evans with nasaspaceflight.com. A uh, question for the whole crew. Um, considering how much has been invested from each and every one of you personally and, and professionally over the last couple of years, uh, and also with the uh, historic goals that this mission has for commercial space, how do you think this mission might affect you personally? I guess, you know, I think it will without a doubt impact me. I, it already, already has. Um, these last two and a half years have been absolutely impactful in the most incredible way. Um, but I think one way that I am really looking forward to, to being impacted is, is the learning. I think that, like Sarah said, you know, I've spent years trying to put myself in the seat of astronauts in space, and I am really looking forward to learning what, firsthand what that experience is actually like, learning as much as I can about our operations, the, the crew experience, um, and bringing that back to SpaceX and human space exploration endeavors. Man, that's a, that's a tough question to answer uh, on a personal level, level, and I think that's exactly it because anyone could be in the seat. Um, 
you know, that I'm, I'm sitting in right now. It's, it's, it's a collective effort, and it's bigger than any individual. Um, and it took an entire team uh, to get to where we're at in this mission. Um, and I think that's what makes our, our future so bright with space exploration, is that it will be someone else sitting in these seats in the future. Um, and I'm just thankful to be a part of it with this crew. I, I think there are very few things as impactful as the realization of how many people it takes to do this and how many people we are bringing with us on this journey. Every piece of software, every piece of hardware, um, it, it is a team effort. It's an entire city of people to make this happen. Um, and I think, as Kit said, any of us, anyone could be in these seats and we're incredibly fortunate to be here. But really just hoping to bring back as much as we can to the team and really bring SpaceX along on this journey. Um, it is first-hand learning, as Anna said, um, in support of really ambitious object objectives for the, for the company. So I'm sure we cannot possibly know all the ways it will impact us, um, but very grateful to be here and very excited to bring that back with the team. And I, I feel incredibly lucky to be here as well uh, with a great team. And, surrounded by so many awesome individuals at SpaceX every day. I find it all quite inspiring. I found it very inspiring when you know, my journey began, which actually was, it was November 2020. It was the first time I went to SpaceX for, for medical checks. And uh, I tried to come away from all of that experience, essentially those first couple years of just, uh, or first year, um, you know, being inspired by all the amazing people that I think work at the most innovative organization in the world and say, how do I take that back and professionally grow from this too and learn from, all that magic that they incorporate every single day. And then being in space and, you know, an unexpected moment where, you know, the moon uh, rose uh, while I was looking at Earth. I didn't expect to see it. And it was just, man, we, uh, we got to just keep this thing going. Uh, you know, my, I wasn't alive when humans walked on the moon. I'd certainly like my kids to see humans walking on the moon and Mars and venturing out and exploring our solar system because I think we, as we all know, if we're here, like we, we've barely dipped, dipped our toe in the ocean. Barely. I mean, we haven't even scratched the surface yet. And now, you know, with reusable rockets and starships on the horizon, it's like there's so much to go out and explore and discover uh, along the way. So I found, it, I, I found the experience here on Earth uh, on this you know, journey I've been on for about four years to be very inspiring and equally so uh, in space. I imagine it won't be much different coming back from this one. Hi, well, Robinson Smith with Spaceflight Now. Good to see you all again. Um, question for Bill and Sarah, I think, and then I have a follow-up for Jared. Um, with this mission and its profile, is there anything in particular that will be able to port over into the further certification of Crew Dragon beyond its current five flights? And if so, what specific dynamics are those? There's a couple things. The high altitude will give us exposure to the, this high radiation environment which will test a lot of avionic systems and their ability to recover. We build a lot of auto sequences to take care of that for us, but we'll see how it really works. We'll also get a chance to see the laser communication, which I think is a big deal moving forward. And then I think a lot of the suit activities, even though they're not, you know, they're geared more towards mobility. So some of the joints and some of the motion and activities are more geared towards walking on another terrestrial body than they are just doing the EVA. So we're going to learn all that as we move forward. So I think there's a lot of neat technology that this crew has already helped us learn, but now we're going to actually see them demonstrate in space. So I'm pretty excited about this mission and, and what we're going to learn. Yeah, and I think just to add one thing, there's one of the things I'm most excited about from this development effort is all of the learnings that are going to go back into Dragon operation. New software features, new, like, how the suits are constructed. There is learning across every single team, materials, engineering, you name it, there are, there has been development and there has been lessons learned. Um, one of my favorite things, training crew over crew, is seeing how every single flight gets better and that's what SpaceX does. They take the lessons learned and they immediately incorporate it into future vehicles. Um, so I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to the debriefs to just see that comprehensive look at all the lessons we're gonna be moving into future human spaceflight. Thank you, and to Jared, um, 
you mentioned the obviously the tether is the length that the tether is, but is there an operational reason why you and Sarah are not going fully outside of the Dragon that you can expound upon? Oh, we will be fully outside Dragon. Um, I mean, our we we might move up and down uh, as part of a, a translation test, but um, like we'll be well above where the hatch is. Um, we're just maintaining at least. I think uh, we, we have a hands-free demonstration where we'll, it'll only be our feet engaged in a mobility aid. Um, we're just not going to be just floating around, which I, I think the picture was very cool and it's, it's inspirational. And certainly, you know, the, the Ed White uh, f uh, photo was, is, is historic. But I think as, um, you know, Buzz Aldrin taught us that it, that's not the right way to do an EVA. Um, you, uh, you know, it, it takes a lot of effort uh, to move in the suit um, you know, when it's pressurized. I mean, it, it, what, it, what looks like really, you know, like heavy clothing when it's unpressurized becomes super rigid uh, when it's pressurized. So you, you want to like be very deliberate with your movements. You want to make good use of mobility aids. Um, and it was actually a lot of that pioneering work from, from Buzz Aldrin that, you know, set up um, a lot of future EVAs for success. So it uh, looks cool, inspirational, um, which is always part of every one of these missions, but I think we want to learn from, um, from history on this one and try and always maintain at least one point of contact with the mobility aid. I think this will be our final question. Hi there, Kristen Fisher with CNN, and my question is for Gerst. Uh, Gerst, you've spent so many years working in human spaceflight at NASA. You know all too well. Uh, that NASA astronauts are still using the same EVA suits that they've been using for about 40 years. NASA's trying to get new ones, but it's proven to be a challenge for the space agency. And so I'm curious, now that you've shifted over to the private sector, what it's been like for you to watch this rapid evolution of uh, an EVA suit by SpaceX in just under two years? Again, I think it's, it's super fun being at SpaceX. And, and as they described, we're really a team. So we leverage off of what we learned from NASA in some ways, and then we push it a little bit further in other areas. And then we share with each other what we know, what we don't know, and we really test and evaluate and make sure we're going forward and doing things the right way. This pace of development that we get to do at SpaceX is very much like the pace of development that was required back in the early Apollo days. We're getting a chance to do that again, where we're really starting to push frontiers with the private sector and learning new things that we would not be able to learn by staying in the risk-free environment of here on Earth. It's time to go out. It's time to explore. It's time to do these big things and move forward. Bam. Let's here. go. <laughs> and that concludes our uh, press event. Again, thank you for your attendance. And I think you got to meet an extremely special crew. Follow them during their mission. Follow what they're doing and learn and, and explore just like they're the explorers moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Very informative. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.